I had no assurances that I'd be back in WWE again. So I felt like maybe the two years that I had spent in NXT, getting to that point was just a waste of my time because I was going to have to go do something else now. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Out of Character. I'm your host, Ryan Satin. And this week on the podcast, we've got Top Dollar, a.k.a. AJ Francis, super excited to get him on the show. I have uh, I've been wanting him on here for a while, and he's been he's been hard uh, on me for not having him on the show yet. So I'm glad we finally got him on here. But just real fast before we get to the conversation between myself and Top Doll, I do want to mention one thing. If you're watching this on video, please go check out the Out of Character podcast feed. Because if you're not subscribed to the podcast feed, you're missing out on some content. I appreciate you watching the show on video. I'm super excited. I think it's better on video because you can see me and my guests' faces. But you can also have be on the podcast feed if you subscribe there. Obviously, you get the audio version of this show. But also, on top of that, there's Raw and SmackDown roundups that I do. Podcasts breaking each episode of Monday Night Raw and SmackDown down smack down down but i'm breaking those down segment by segment giving you my thoughts on each thing that happens there's lots happening i talked about things like mia yim coming back we did a roundup on crown jewel too talking about logan paul so make sure you're subscribed to the out of character podcast feed so that way you get those in your ear holes all right enough shilling for my podcast here let's get to my conversation with top dollar uh, let's start this off the way i start off every podcast and that is me asking you how much of your real true self is there in the character that you play on tv um 100 uh top dollar is just aj francis but in the wwe i mean he's a rapper he's a trash talker he uh completely believes in himself thinks he's gonna win everything that he does um and he likes to have a good time still sometimes at his opponent's expense and uh, that is absolutely me to a T. If you don't believe me, watch me play FIFA. <laughs> well, what words would you use to describe your off-screen personality? Are those some of the words that you would use right there, like confident, trash talker, believe in absolutely. yourself? Absolutely. People, people, people have always thought that I was cocky or arrogant just because I believed in myself. Well, the thing is, so many people didn't believe in me that if I listened to them, I wouldn't be where I am. I wouldn't have done the things that I've done. So... The reason why I'm confident, and you see a pretty little picture of me from my time in the NFL, the reason why I'm so confident is because millions, not millions, because obviously I haven't had this conversation with millions of people, but hundreds of people told me I'd never make it to the NFL. You know what I'm saying? They told me I'd never graduate college. I'd never make it to the WWE. And I did all those things. And I did it pretty easily. So to me, it's like, like of course I'm going to believe in myself. Why shouldn't I believe in myself? I, I, if I don't believe in me, why should you believe in me? Well, was that happening from like when you were a kid? Because hundreds, that's got to be a lot of people. And I know that like in reading your background, oh, yeah. you definitely, you know, had like, you know, not as easy of an upbringing as other people maybe around you and stuff. So, I mean, is that kind of why people were saying that to you from such a young age? Yeah, I mean, I'm the only person from my neighborhood, you know what I'm saying, that made it to the NFL. Like, I'm the only person, like, I go back and I do these events in my neighborhood and like people look at me like, I'm an alien. They look at me like, ah, they can't believe that I've done the things that I've done. And like, it's crazy because like adults that I grew up around, because my dad was really big in the community, um, adults that I grew up around, like I, I see their kids and they always post up like, hey, see, guys, he's proof that you guys can do it. And to me, that's amazing because like, I didn't have that example. Like I didn't have anyone that I could look to and be like, that's the kind of life that I wanted to, I want to have i had people that i could look at to be like this is the kind of life i need to get away from and those are two completely different motivating factors um there's you know studies out there to, to determine you know which is better than the other but at the end of the day like i am blessed to be able to do the things that i've done because there are so many people that i grew up with that would have loved to you know do the things that i've done live the life i live and just weren't able to get that opportunity for one reason or another 
it's got to be such a trip when someone says that to you, though, because I know like even in the town I came from and there's successful people from the town I came in. But I get that sometimes from people like, man, I tell my kids like this guy went to school with me. Like you could do that if you follow just like the, your yeah. one passion that you like, like you can make a career out of it. And it, like it genuinely it's like the most inspiring thing that anyone can tell me, it, like makes you want to keep doing it. Yeah. And the fun, it's funny you said one passion, because like of all the things that I've done, like football is the thing that opened the door for everything, but it was like my least passion. You know what I'm saying? Like I just happened to be really good at football. So I was able to make a career out of it. And I was able to get college degrees because of it. And I was able to open my doors to music and get opportunities to work with people in the music industry that I would have never gotten opportunity to as a regular independent artist. And I, and I wouldn't have been all the wrestlers out there that dreamed to get a trial with WWE. And all I had to do was, you know, meet Matt Bloom one time and sell him. I played in the NFL and boom, I had a trial like that. So it's like, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. it, I understand that football opens so many different doors for me, but it's funny because even when I was in the NFL, people would be like, oh man, this is amazing. Like you get to live your dream. How's it, how is it living your dream in the NFL? And I'm like, well, I'm living one of my dreams. Like my real dream is to be a WWE. My real dream is to win the Royal Rumble. My real dream is to be WWE champion. Like, Also, I want to say, real dreams. anyone who's watching this who thinks that AJ Top Dollar might be blowing smoke at all is wrong because I tend to, when I'm doing these interviews, I'll put the person's name that I'm going to interview into YouTube and I'll go back and try and find the oldest video I can find of them on YouTube. I'll go back. For you, it was 2011. And the first video I find of you, it's a profile that was that some guy on YouTube did on you in college. And they're talking about how you made this version of black and yellow and uh -huh. how, you know, your school was like, it became like the anthem for everyone at school. Yeah, it's, it's, called, it's, it's called Fear the Turtle and they still play it at the sports games that barely like, it's I made a, a, a University of Maryland version of Black and Yellow shouting out on the sports team, and I had to I performed it at all the sport events. Like that, it took over the University of Maryland. Oh yeah, they still playing. They're showing games. like other athletes at the school being like, "Oh, we love AJ's song." Like you know, everyone's talking about it, and it's like, and, and then and it's you going like, "Yeah," and they go, "You know, AJ's a football player. He plays for the Terps, but he does say that like at the end of the day, like he does want to end up in the WWE and lay the SmackDown one day." And and then it cuts to you and you're like, yeah, dude, The Rock's my idol. I grew up watching The Rock and like, you know, I got to watch him lay the smackdown. And so like one day I want to be laying the smackdown like my idol, The Rock. And I'm like, dude, this is 2011. Yeah. And now he's on video. smackdown as a superstar. And I was yeah. like, that's literally like, man, like that's literally like the goal, the dream, like what you want to accomplish as a person. And I'm like, you can see young him so passionate about it. You're also talking about music. Yeah. but And like you said, Football, even though that's like the gateway in for you, they're talking about your music. They're talking about you wanting to wrestle. They have you cut a promo like The Rock in the video. And I'm mm -hmm. like, this is this is amazing. And it's funny because like videos like that, I, they when they would come out, you know, 10 years ago, people would be like, oh, that, that's interesting. And then you look, eh, and that would be the end of it. But then like now you look back at it now, you're like, oh my God, I can't believe it. I'm like, yeah, bro, I've been trying to tell you guys for 15 years already. <laughs> <laughs> That's what's so cool to me is I, I look at that and I'm like, like, you know, people, you know, sometimes like the internet, Twitter, a lot of times on Twitter, I, I do think that they tend to, the people who are passionate about their whatever, passionate about something and have like gone out of their way to go follow their dreams, do tend to get a little more crap on social media from people and they're called cocky when in reality they're being called cocky by people who don't have the balls to like go do something like that and believe in exactly. themselves as much as you. So like if you were eight years old and you told your mom, I'm going to play in the NFL and I'm going to go to WWE. And then by the time you were 30 years old, you did all that. Why wouldn't you be confident? <laughs> like, like, why wouldn't you believe in yourself? You know like, I don't understand how these people think. They want me to have a lack of confidence because they don't believe in me. But I don't care if you don't believe in me because I believe in me. Like, I don't understand the concept, but, you know. Who was the first own, person? Who, do you remember, like, some of the early people who did believe in you that helped you get to where you are? 
Uh, yeah, my, I mean, my parents, my dad, my mom, they, they, even though, like, they never told me I couldn't do it. Because basically, like, my whole life, that's what I've done. Like, I told my parents what I wanted to do. And, like, early on, they always supported me. They always told me that they, if I put the work in, I'd be able to do it. Like, and my, their only thing was that I did good in school. But to me, school was always easy. So that was nothing. I was just, you know, grateful for the fact that I had parents that believed in me. And um, when I was eight years old and I would tell them I want to play in the NFL or I want to go to WWE, they didn't say like, well, maybe you should look into like engineering or electrical work. There's always work there. You know, people always, no, they never said that what I wanted to do was out of reach. And because of that, you know, I instilled a confidence in me because I personally have, even if like, the dream is out there and it's far fetched and there's no way that you can get to it. Like to me, I can, I think I can still get it done. Um, even when I first started wrestling, people told me hit row wouldn't work because, uh, oh, well, you know, hip hop and wrestling, you know, it has to be more of a caricature. It can't be the real thing. And I'm like, why? And they're like, oh, well, you know, it works better when it's, I was like, well, let me try it the way that I know that I can do it and not be a caricature and just be me. Like, People were like, oh, I, I, my favorite thing happened today on Twitter, too. People would be like, oh, why, how come, you know, when they're a black group, they always got to be rappers or something. I was like, bro, I was a rapper before I got to WWE. Like, that's not like a, they didn't, they didn't say, hey, go out there and be a rapper, kid. Like, no, like I had two albums before I got here. So <laughs> same with Brianna. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. it's like, for them, people don't even know that, but they just open their mouths because they think they know everything. And yep. it's, the, you know, situations like that. Well, I literally read an article that you were like talking about how like you had like a little mini recording studio in your like in your room of some sort since you were like a kid. So, mm -hmm. yeah, you've yeah. literally been rapping your whole life. So why wouldn't you want to bring that to TV? Exactly. I've been rapping since literally I was 12 years old. I've been rapping longer than I've been playing football. That's so crazy. think about that for a second. You've been yeah. so you had recording <laughs> equipment since you were like 12 or around that age. Uh, when I was I had a microphone and like a that plugged into the back of a computer, like an old laptop. And then I had a, a like a program. I can't even remember the name of the program, but it just recorded. With, it wasn't a good mic. It sounded like terrible, but it was, a, I was making songs in my bedroom. I used to put it on my ironing board, right? And have the microphone propped up because it wasn't like a stall, tall stand up mic. Like this right here, this is a $1,200 mic, right? Yeah, that's the nice this kind. Is, yeah, that's the good kind. That's the good is, kind of recording, recording stuff. Theory. This is this is real. This is where I really record. Like every Frank style you heard when I when we made the Hit Row theme song, we recorded this all here, right? So like, um, my like now I have top of the line same equipment Twenty One Savage and Drake and Future and all these guys use. I use the same equipment as them. But when I was twelve years old, I used to prop it up on my ironing board. It was a little mic stand, probably about as big as my forearm. Used to prop it on the ironing board, put the laptop right there, and I'd be rapping right into that thing, making songs. And it was like, to me, you couldn't tell me I wasn't in, you know, saying Studio Fifty One. I wasn't, you know, what I'm saying like, you couldn't tell me I wasn't there. But obviously, if you listen to it, especially nowadays, you can tell I wasn't. Were you like, okay, so you're recording stuff? What year would this be? That when you're 12, 13, like that? Two thousand two. Two thousand two. So the internet, there's, there's. There's internet popping, but there's not like. Were you trying to like? Yeah. Like, were you trying to hustle my these space, tapes? baby? You're MySpace, my okay. <laughs> baby. Come on, man. You feel me? I was, and I was burning tapes, and I was, I was making tapes. I was sold them for five dollars a pop. One of my first, one of my first projects was called Back in Love, but Love was an acronym. It stood for Life of Violent Endeavors. You know what I'm saying? So like, I was out here. I was really out here with it. And my rap name at the time was Fat Man. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so it was Beautiful. a different time. <laughs> it was a different time back then. You, know, you got an Afro man. He's popping. Maybe I'll just be Fat yeah. Man, you know? <laughs> Fat Man, you know what I'm saying? Fat <laughs> Man had the hits. Fat Man is the reason Top Dollar is so hot today. I'll tell you what. <laughs> I feel like it's, it's funny, you know, when you see the internet now, you know, and ways for someone to blow up. YouTube, TikTok, whatever. I think that uh -huh. like people underestimate, you know, how hard it was to create, like to to get a whole fan base on MySpace. It was like such a different oh time. Oh my god! Well, the internet access was just so much, so much more limited. Like 
kids, believe it or not, when you want to get on the internet, you had to get on the computer. <laughs> <laughs> like, you didn't have the internet in your pocket. That's just that's not how that worked. I found that like old until, message like, board I was, posts like, of later mine. in high school. <laughs> oh yeah, that was definitely in high school. I found like message board posts of mine from like 2006. I want to say. Or I'm on like an old wrestling message board. I went and used that way back machine to try and find like what I was talking about in wrestling in 2006. And I'm like, guess what, guys? I just got internet on my phone. Like I'm literally <laughs> getting paid at work to be on the internet. Like this is awesome. And I'm like, that's so funny. I, that, that was only 2006. And mind you, like that was groundbreaking. <laughs> yes. Now if somebody doesn't have internet on their phone, you're like, ooh. What? What are you doing? Is this like a burner Ooh. phone or something? Like, yeah. are you doing illegal activity on that phone or something? Yeah. You, oh, you got multiple SIM cards, huh? Okay, I see how it is. <laughs> yeah, every time I'll walk by, every time like I'm at like a like a Best Buy or Target or whatever, you always kind of see like one little stack of CDs that you can like blank CDs that people could burn. And I always look at it thinking, who's still Who burning still? CDs yeah. or DVDs? Oh, bro. I was burning my own CDs. I was doing monthly mixes. This I was making money in middle school because I was a hustler. So look, every every month I have a new mix of like ten to fifteen songs of like what the new hot songs is right now, right? And I would sell them for five dollars a pop to burn CDs, and I had the mixes on. I was like, now what you call music, but in middle school, you know what I'm saying? And I would change it every month. I have it, and I have like it would it would be like uh. It would be like, uh, like, uh, uh, like, it would be like, uh, August jams, you know, September flow, you know, like, <laughs> and these, and these, and these dumbass names that I was putting on these CDs. I was selling them for five dollars a pop. You felt real fly when you had like shit. one of those like blue colored Man, CDs what? to make it a little different that time. You know, get the colored Man, ones what? when they came out. Those were so when it, nah, nah, what really kicked it off was when they came out with the jokes that had the just flat white front part, so I could literally write whatever I wanted on there. <laughs> Man, I was drawing in the summertime. I was doing little flames of designs on the side. I'm telling you, I was hot. I was a, I was ahead of my time. I'm telling you. <laughs> I kind of miss the simplicity of that time period, man. Like I really do, because I used to. God, I used to love drawing on my blank CDs and like making my own cover to it. You'd be sitting there. For, I spend more time uh -huh. drawing on the than the album that I even did listening to it. Probably because I was just sitting there for I'm so long you. trying to make it look cool. <laughs> so okay. Yeah, we're the last. We're the last of the, the generation that uh, lived before the internet. Yes. So, yes. Yeah. De definitely. Definitely. <laughs> Uh, I always think about that. I'm like, wow, we really were the guinea pigs of like that generation of like, we've seen every social media platform along the way. We've seen like the whole evolution of the internet, like right before our eyes. Mm -hmm. And we were like the active guinea pigs, not our parents. Like they, they buy it for us. And then we were just like in it, you know? And I'd be the first person to admit my parents left me alone with the internet too often. Mine too. <laughs> Mine too, for sure. Uh, to, I'm gonna just I, leave it at that. I lied on my ASL <laughs> a lot. I'll say that much. Uh, oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> for sure, lied on the ASL, and, and 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 I got in trouble for a lot of Google searches before I knew you complete that. <laughs> Thankfully, my dad couldn't figure out how to look through what we were downloading on like LimeWire and stuff, so we were safe. My dad. Oh, couldn't... my dad did, and he definitely was not a fan. Well, let me rephrase. He was a fan, but he wasn't a fan of me. Look at that at the time. I'll say that. <laughs> okay, well, on to safer topics. Uh, so, okay, I don't know a lot about football, but like in looking through your Wikipedia and hearing you talk about it, like, you know, you were in there, you were in the NFL for a while, you did your thing there, but it does seem like, just from an outsider perspective who doesn't know a lot about football, it does seem like the struggle of trying to make it onto the active roster full time seems to be kind of frustrating. Is that is that accurate? Uh, it's frustrating only because you know it's has nothing to do with football. Um, if you go back and watch the tape from any of my preseasons, um, go watch me play again on uh, Thursday night, Thanksgiving against the Giants, 2018. Go that same the following week. Go watch me play Thursday night against the Cowboys in Dallas, 2018. I'm playing against Pro Bowlers and I'm dominating them. Let's let's look at the clip. Look at the film. Uh, if you think I'm a liar, go pull up the tape and tell me I'm a liar. All right. Like, but I wasn't drafted. I wasn't anybody's boy. I, nobody was willing to stand on the table for me. So 
when it comes down to, if you're a GM, I'll put it like this. I always put it in layman's terms for people. Let's say you're a GM, Ryan. You just drafted this defensive lineman that you think is going to be good in the second round. You're paying him $10 million, all right? And then one of your scouts, who technically works for you, works under you, finds somebody else that's better than the guy you picked, and y'all don't owe him as much money. So are you going to admit to this owner that pays you millions of dollars? Hey, man, I messed up. I shouldn't have picked this guy. I should have had this guy. Let's play this guy. Or are you going to try to stash this other guy on your practice squad or on the low end of your roster, not giving him as many reps, while you try to hope that the guy that you're paying all this money to grows into the spot, right? Yep. Like, it's very, it's very simple business decision. Go back, watch my tape. That's all I got to say. When I got released from the Tampa Bay Bucks, Gerald McCoy, $100 million man, Gerald McCoy called me and was like, I don't know what we're doing. You should have been starting next to me. Oh, I mean, what more do I need to say? Yeah, and and that's but that's kind of the frustration I'm talking about is that like it does seem to be like it would mess with my head to know all exactly what you just said. That yeah. like, wait, I'm I'm doing better than the person, and I'm cheaper, but because you made that decision, you're gonna like that would drive me insane. Oh, it did, and that's the reason why I'm here today. I mean, so 2018 was my last year in the NFL. Um, I was on the the Giants practice um, uh, off-season roster for training camp. Dominated training camp, probably my best training camp. Go watch the tape if you don't believe me. And um, when after the, after the preseason, they released me. Um, I was like, okay, well, there's not much more I can do there. Um, I start. Tr- I'm still training. I'm ready for my opportunity to come back to the NFL. And in the middle of training and all that, one of my boys. Uh, hosts a Halloween party and he has a wrestling show on it. Um, his name's Mike Busey and he has a wrestling show on his Halloween party. Familiar with Mike goes, Busey? Hey, that's my guy. And I used to actually live at the Sausage Castle. Um, Sausage and Castle. For, for six months I lived there. <laughs> uh, actually, my first WWE contract was sent there because I was living there. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, and, uh, and so he's like, hey man, I'm having a wrestling show. Come be on it. So I do a wrestling show. Never done it before. I debuted a crew. Uh, my character's name was Sugar Bear. And I debuted a car- uh, crew. You may have heard of something similar. They were called the Row. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh-huh. uh, <laughs> and uh, we come out and I held the show. And then after the show, the vets in the locker room—they've been wrestling like ten years. They're like, "Hey, man, so you know, where's your home promotion?" I'm like, "Nah, this, I don't really have one. This, I'm, this is my first time." They're like, "Oh man, that's great. Like, so, so where you've been trained at?" And I'm like, "Nah, I ain't never trained, bro." Like, so I'm you just, hadn't trained once before that match? She just said, nah, go to a match. Nah. You'd watched it your whole life. You were like, cool, no problem, yeah. and did it? No problem. Was I it knew, against I mean, someone who had it. trained? It was a battle royal. So okay, you know, anything got it, got it. Yep, yep, yep. It's easy, easy money. So uh, I did everything. They were like, hey, man, you know, good job. But I did some cool spots in there. Like, uh, I, I, we got to run the clip back. I can see you in the clip. But uh, it was like, uh, yeah, so, uh, well, you know, how were you trained? And I was like, nah, I never never trained before, bro. Just was like, you ain't never trained, and this was your first match? I was like, yeah. He was like, I don't want to tell you what to do. I know you're a free agent in the NFL, but, like, you should probably give wrestling a shot. And in the back of my mind, like, my whole life I had wanted to be wrestling. And I was sitting there, and I was like, why am I putting so much energy into this NFL that don't give a damn about me when I can really start pursuing my dream that I really want to do? So two weeks later, I enrolled at Team 3D uh, Wrestling Academy, and then uh, after that, it was – you know, four months later, I had my tryout, and then two months after that, I got signed. That's so just crazy. Like, That's because I was I, you know, because I I know that from ta- just from following you and stuff that I had seen you talk about doing some indies prior to joining WWE and the, and the row thing. Uh-huh. And then when I was looking at your cage match, I was like, "There's, but there's only a few indies before WWE yeah. on there." So I was like, "Is it missing some?" And so that does fill oh, that yeah, in for me. You start training. <laughs> At Team 3D for the Dudley Boys, yeah, and then and Cage Side doesn't you, really, Cage Side really doesn't really cover Sausage Castle wrestling, believe it or not. Yeah, that's I had a feeling. <laughs> I had a feeling that might be the case when you when you said Sausage Castle, I was like, oh, that's why it's not getting factored in. Uh, Got it. So then, okay, so then you start at Team 3D. You have your tryout four mm-hmm. months later. When did you meet Matt Bloom? Uh, so randomly, my boy uh, Justin Leslie, who used to work at uh, NXT in the social media department invited me to the pre-screening NXT was going to get for the Paige movie, uh, Fighting With My Family. 
And so I went to the event and Bloom walks in and I know he's the head coach at NXT. And Justin's like, yo, go talk to him, introduce yourself. So I go up to him and we have a short conversation. I tell him, yeah, uh, who I am, that I've been training at Team 3D, came from the NFL, had a few matches. And he was like, all right, well, send me an email tomorrow and I'll, you know, give you information back. So I sent him an email with all that information the next morning, like 10 a.m. at 11 a.m. He'll be back later. Uh, an hour later, it was like, all right, your tryouts in two months. I was like, cool. That's that's so crazy because, like, you, you know, like you said earlier, you're like, but I did all these things and they were kind of easy for me. So, like, of course I'm going to be confident. Like, usually, like, <laughs> you'll hear someone like, I hit, like, like, I hit this person up every month. I had to bang their door down, like, you yeah. know, and, like, you're like, I just ran into him at the movies and he was like, email me and I was in, you know, like it was in between popcorn and fighting with my family, you know? Like Yeah, literally, <laughs> that's exactly that's all it was. So it's like, that's why to me it's funny because like, and I know, you know, a lot of wrestlers, they work their whole life to get to WWE. And I mean, I did too. Like the reason why I was able to get into WWE so easily through these efforts is because I played in the NFL. I had to work my ass off to be able to get to the NFL. Like, it's not like I was just, oh, you know what? I think I'm gonna try out for the Dolphins today. Oh, well, that's not how that works. Like you had to actually put the work in. I worked for a decade plus to get to the NFL, so I put the work in. It was just a different kind of work. It's like how people are like salty with Logan Paul because man, Logan Paul shouldn't be in that spot because it's his third match ever. But Logan Paul should be in that spot because he brings a crowd. He is a draw, and clearly he showed he deserved to be in that spot because it was only his third match, and look what the hell he did. Like, yes, are there a 100 other people that, if given the opportunity, could have had an amazing match with Roman Reigns in the main event of Crown Jewel? Absolutely. But that doesn't take away from the fact that he also deserved it. And he brought probably more eyes than someone who is maybe more Bingo. deserving, which is good for everybody. It, 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 it's good for Bingo. all. And I also think with you, you know, like you were saying, you know, uh, working your whole life towards it. Like, I think that you being such a hardcore wrestling fan your whole life, I mean, yeah. to where you were even, me you know, in my position back in the day of, like, doing a wrestling podcast and, like, covering the business, mm -hmm. I think that because you were such a big wrestling fan, I think that you also know that, like, NFL maybe got your foot in the door, but, you know, you doing the music, you doing the on-camera stuff, like, you interviewing people, like, you doing... Yeah. Uber videos when you're in the NFL and stuff uh -huh. like you're doing all these things because you were trying to enhance your on camera presence so that you'd be more comfortable so that when you got your foot in the door, you could show them that you were supposed to stay there. Yeah. And I mean, I have one goal left. It's the host of tonight show. Like that's my end goal at the end of all of this 20 years from now. Right. That's what I want to do. Um, and I started when I was in high school doing videos about trying to make myself better on camera, being able to perform on camera, understanding how you should present yourself when presenting a scene, as opposed to when you are doing an interview, as opposed to when you are doing wrestling and it's action and you have to work different cameras at the same time. Like I I've been teaching myself that since I was 14 years old. So like now, you know, I'm 32 uh, and it's like all coming to fruition. When I got that gig hosted on A&E for WWE's Most Wanted Treasures, like, WWE didn't pitch me to get that gig. And, like, they didn't, they had no, like, they had no real reason for me to want to, for them to want me to be that role because I hadn't been on TV yet. Like, I hadn't done anything yet. Like, they wanted somebody that had already been on TV. But the network and the production company were like, nah, we've seen what he's done on ESPN and NFL Network and Fox and NBC Sports and ABC and all these other things that I did when I was in the NFL and when I was in college. And they were like, nah, we want him. And anybody who watches that show knows that it was a great idea that they used me because it was a, I did a really good job in that show, and the show itself was really good. I loved that show. You did a great job on that show. Uh, I think that and, – and I agree that, like, sometimes you don't want someone who's necessarily already been on a bunch of other shows. Like you want to find new voices on TV. You know, you want to, mm -hmm. you want to put a spotlight on other new people who might be up and coming that are more, that are also entertaining. And I think that like you yeah. filled that role perfectly because you were not only 
a good on-camera presence on the show, but you were so passionate about the product. Like yeah. You were so passionate about what you guys were doing, and I think it did come across on TV. Because it was cool to me, man. Like, I, I wasn't, that wasn't phony. Like, when we're, when I'm with, sitting with the Undertaker, we're looking at what a Paul Bear earned. Like, that's one of the coolest things that's ever happened to me. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, I don't have to act like, oh, man, let me make sure that the audience can tell that I'm really excited. I'm just really excited. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm I get that like, like, like that. with like, my reaction videos when I'm at a pay per view and they're like, and I'm all excited about something that happened and they're like, he's faking this. And I'm like, yo, I'm being paid to watch wrestling in person and talk about it afterwards and something cool just happened. I genuinely am excited about this. It's gonna be hard to not be excited about this. I was here in person. Who Who's sitting at a live event and was like, Phew. That was stupid. You know, like you're excited. You're going to be excited, you know? And so the same thing with you. Like you're sitting there with Teddy Long. You're sitting there with The Undertaker and Kane, Mark Henry and Big Show. Like you got all these cool people. Like why wouldn't you be excited? No, how about, how about when we go meet Bob Backlund? And they're like, all right, in order to get, they're like, in order to get the, uh, the, the Persian clubs, you got to do the Persian clubs. And I ain't never done a Persian club in a day of my life. Like I've, I've never even tried them. But obviously, I'm really strong. So, like, they're like, yeah, you can be able to do that, right? I was like, I don't know. I hope so. Like, I think, maybe. Uh, there was another one uh, that I was able to do it, and I felt like then the list in WWE history became Bob Backlund, <laughs> Iron Sheik, and Top Dollar. So that was pretty cool. Yeah, but you did do was, that. Was, you <laughs> did do that, and you made it look so effortless that, a few, yeah. in fact, a few weeks later, I went to my sister's house and her now husband, I go in the backyard, and what does he have? Persian clubs for some reason. I don't know why he has, why he works out with Persian clubs. He's not like, I mean, he's, a, he's a big dude, you know? And I'm like, I'm like, let me try that. Like, he made it look pretty easy on the Most Wanted Treasure show. I genuinely felt like I'd pulled my arms out of their sockets when I tried it. Like, I went like, oh, dude. And I was like, ow, my arms. Like, what am I doing? Like, yeah. no, I don't, I can't do this. Yeah. They're heavy. It's pretty, it's, they're pretty tough, man, especially if you've never done it before. Yeah. Um, there was another thing that we did that I actually couldn't do that it ended up not making the show. But uh, Mark Henry has this, like, dumbbell in his house that's like, I don't even know how much it weighs, but it's like this thick around. So like you, any other dumbbell, I can like grab my whole hand around, I have giant hands and I can do whatever I want. This one's so thick that you have to hold it like this, right? And like the 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 trick is like, the whole thing is being able to pick it up and put it above your head. Like if you can do that, you you got it, right? So like I could get it off the ground, which is, which Mark was just impressed about himself. He was like, oh Mark, I couldn't believe that you got it up. So many people can't even do that. But I couldn't, I couldn't do the transfer and then lift at all. And then he was just like walked over and was just like, and he's like 50. And I'm like, what the heck? Like, Mark, you just got different strikes, bro. Like, he's like, yeah, it's all about that finger strength. It's all about that finger strength. I was like, I need to work on my finger. <laughs> you, you're over there just trying to do finger stretches. Yeah. I was like, I got off the ground and I felt strong. I was like, all right, cool. So I'm like, oh, no, I can't do that. Can't do that. <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit. I, you know, we've talked more positive, fun things, but I do want to like briefly touch upon the like elephant in the room that happened. So, what was your initial reaction to getting released when you got the call? Um, disappointment, uh, like shame. Uh, I I worked to get to that point. And like we had the fastest call up ever in NXT history to then be released a month later. It was like, I felt like I, well, honestly, I didn't know that this would happen again. Like I did, I, I had no assurances that I'd be back at WWE again. So I felt like maybe the two years that I had spent in NXT getting to that point was just a waste of my time because I was going to have to go do something else now. Um, and what, ended up happening, which was a blessing, was the fact that, like, I always stayed in contact with Hunter. And, um, you know, we didn't always just, we didn't talk wrestling all the time. We just talked every once in a while about random things. And um, um, when he obviously got back in charge, I saw him bring Dakota and EO back. And I was like, oh, okay, all right, cool. So he's bringing people back. Like, 
I had absolutely like I was like maybe he'll bring us back, but like I don't know, you know how he feels. I don't know what he's trying to you know accomplish. I don't know what he's going through. And then like two days later, he calls me, and I'm like, oh okay, yeah, let's do this. I'm ready. Let's rock. You know what I'm saying? But like uh, when when we first got released, man, it was tough. It was like I was uh, I was genuinely depressed. Like I had spent my entire life looking for the chance to get an opportunity to be on SmackDown, to be on Raw. And then I got there and then a month later, it got taken out from underneath me. So it was like one of the worst experiences and times of my life. And um, the thing is, is like, you never, people say all the time, you never really find something you're looking for, it finds you. Um, And so like, I wasn't looking to come back to WWE anymore because I felt that the door was closed. It took me like six months to get to that point, right? And so I was off doing other shows in Trinidad and Tobago and going off and, um, you know, doing GCW and all these other events that I would have never done, you know, otherwise. Because I was sitting there like, well, I still want to wrestle. And honestly, I didn't expect that. I, I I always wanted to wrestle in WWE. And even though I did wrestle in the Indies before I got to WWE, that was just me practicing, getting reps, because I knew once I got a tryout, I was going to be in WWE. Yep. I just knew it. Because I'm, I'm, I mean, people, like I said, people say it's cockiness, but I'm promo guy. And if you feel I'm the wrong, diss me. Right? So, like, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I knew I was going to get a chance uh, in WWE. So, like, once that got taken away, I was like, do I even want to wrestle anymore? Like, do I care about wrestling? No, I'm not in WWE. And, like, it took, like I said, six months before I was like, man, I'm really, I, I'm trying to wrestle, bro. Like, wrestling is really, like, I can't explain to someone who's never done it. I'd rather wrestle in front of a crowd of 500 people than when I played football in front of 100,000 people. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'd rather wrestle on Friday night SmackDown in front of 2 million people than when I played on Thursday night football in front of 10 million people. You know what I'm saying? Like, it, it, there's no, it, there's no comparison. Out with it. So like, I, I felt like, you know what? I'm going to start wrestling again. I'm going to get back into it. I'm going to do my thing. And I started doing it more. And then lo and behold, <laughs> right when I was like, you know what? There's life after WWE, WWE called me right back. So I was like, Hey, just when I think I'm out, they pull me right back. <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy so it was two days it was like two days after the whole dakota literally, stuff literally so it was like so the dakota and, and eo they come back at SummerSlam, and i'm sitting there and i'm like man this is so cool um and then oh, i'm sorry it was a week and two days because then it was then cross came back yeah right? yeah and then and then after cross came back um everybody was like who's gonna be next da, 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 da. People and making the me, me specifically me. making the infinity gauntlet meme and stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Like and so like Connor called me and was like, Hey, how are you? I'm like, Great. He's like, uh what, you know, Tahuti Brianna, where they at? I'm like, they're good to go. He's like, How how fast can I have you? I was like, You have us tomorrow if you really want, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, uh, you know, we ended up scheduling a, a meeting, just the three of us and Hunter, the next day, talking out, you know, the steps of the plan. And then, you know, a week after that, we debuted. So it was it was really fast. The That's turnaround. crazy. I, like I said, I, I cannot thank Hunter enough, man. Like, I really was in a bad place mentally because of the situation that we were in. And, like, and like for him to, you know, on the phone call, be like, man, I don't know what happened. And I don't care. He's like, you got a clean skate, you got a clean slate. He's like, you're here now. It's no problem on our end. I hope it's no problem on your end. And I was like, hmm, I'm cool. <laughs> like, I'm back. So now you see, I got my, I got my company man hat on. You know what I'm saying? So. <laughs> well, does, you know, I'm wondering, and then we'll move on from this. But I am wondering, you know, with the way that happened and you coming back now, you know. Is there anything from that month long experience or what you dealt with after that, that makes you approach this second run any differently at all? Uh, yeah, I really stick to myself. Um, 
Uh, if I'm in the locker room with the boys, we do, you know what I'm saying? That's different. We all kick it. And I'm very grateful because I haven't been to Raw, but the SmackDown locker room is just a great time, man. There's no egos in there. There's no, everybody wants everybody to succeed. Everybody wants everybody to be great. We, we kick it. We like actually are like homies in the locker room. Um, and that's from, I wasn't experiencing that from before because I wasn't there long enough. But, like, I've heard from the past that, like, you know, sometimes, like, the locker room wasn't the best place um, for certain people. And now it's uh, – there's there's no problems in there. And I'm, and I'm very grateful for that. But, like, we're at a point now where, like, we just want to we, – we were gone for nine months, and we haven't even been back for three months. So, like, we're trying to rev back up everything that we're doing, and it's been working. Week after week, we get more and more opportunities, more and more experiences. We got the tag with, with Shinsuke. I mean, think about this. I was at Shinsuke's debut in Dallas. Oh, that's so cool. Uh, I mean, uh, or was it Dallas? Yeah, yeah, no, it was Dallas. With Sh- was, yeah, against Sammy. It was Sammy. Yeah, in I was Dallas, also there. I was at I was at that show in the fourth row. There's a picture of it that I posted on my social media. I'm at that show in the fourth row. To then... X amount of years later, being a tag team match with him on SmackDown, it's like, come on, man. Like, the, the year after WrestleMania in 33, yeah, in Orlando, me and all my homies wore Shinsuke shirts, different Shinsuke shirts to the NXT show. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> That's crazy, dude. To, the, to then now we're, we tagged with him, it's like insane. So well, that means, I mean. It's crazy how fast everything happens. If we're just like. Then the rock matches eventually then. If we got we got Oh, you know, that's what I need. That's what I need. <laughs> if we're checking things down. off here, you know, I can tell I the rocks down. the top of the totem pole there, the head of the table. Oh, yeah. I the only only problem is that I don't know how many No, let me rephrase. I know for a fact Rock could wrestle every wrestle. He can the shape to wrestle every WrestleMania for the rest of his life if he really wanted to. <laughs> but I don't know how many more matches he got left. Like, I'm just like saying, how much hey, he, I'm just saying, if you how want, many if you, he wants to wrestle, if you need to have an unattainable, a, a difficult to attain goal, just put that one on Absolutely. there. You know, like you've gotten Absolutely. all these other yeah, ones off, you might as well put a, a, a one on there. You know, and I'm and I'm not kicking out of the people's elbow. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> I don't care what the the what anyone to what, what the book it was any of that. I don't care none of that. He hits the people's elbow. That's the finish. That's the match is over. Okay, so wait. You said, <laughs> you said that the only goal you really have left is the Tonight Show. But when I was mm-hmm. reading an article from when you were younger, you said that it. This is what the article said. It said, uh, after trying his luck in the NFL and maybe enjoying a few years wrestling in the WWE, AJ plans to run years, for governor man. as a Democrat. So. Are you? Yeah. Do, do you still have political aspirations, or is that a goal that you oh, kind of put on the back oh, I burner? Do. I do, but what I've realized from the political process as of recently, especially as recently as two days ago, is that like I, for example, in next weekend I have a camp food drive at the University of Maryland um, for a homeless shelter in the neighborhood uh, by the neighborhood I grew up in. Um, it's called Sarah's House, and every year for Thanksgiving we do a food camp food drive um, for most of the people that live, like 80% of the people there are kids or like moms with kids getting away from, you know, domestic situations or maybe their house burned down or maybe they can't afford to live there anymore, whatever the reason may be that they're there. And um, I have done that for six years. And yet people will still tell me that I'm selfish and that I don't care about things and because they don't agree with me politically, right? Or they don't agree with me for, for one reason or another. I have distaste in my mouth about getting into politics because I actually want to get things done. And people that get things done um, are hated. The people that don't do anything, that just read random quotes from stupid texts and all types of other ways that they can get more attention on themselves, those are the people that are applauded in politics and to me i think that i can do more outside of politics now but eventually maybe one day i can be governor maybe i can uh, actually change things but people don't want change from their politicians they just you know want good quotes and that's not what i'm about dude that makes 
perfect sense to me. I also think the political landscape from 2016 when this article was written to now is so different. Like I was getting my hair cut today. Yeah, it is. Like I was getting my hair cut today and the guy, we started talking about the midterm elections and he then started talking to me about how uh, every president is, has been part of the Illuminati, how they're all Satan worshipers who are also lizard people. I started asking about lizard people and his theories on them. And I started asking too many questions. And he goes, I don't know, man, like the way you're talking right now, I think you might be a lizard person who thinks I know too much. I mean, you work at Fox sports, you've got your own show. And I was like, <laughs> I'm not a lizard person. What? I was just asking about your thoughts on the lizard people, like to see if you thought they were real. And he was like, I don't know, man, like you're asking a lot of questions and you're like, <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> You, you, I mean, you know, you strike me as a lizard person. You know? No, no, we're not. No, we can't get this rolling. We can't get no. I, I, you know, I see lizard people in you. I do. I, I can, I can envision lizard people. You know, your wife's taking pictures of me on the ground. Yeah, You're posting first pictures of, all, let's of me talk on about the ground for a second. <laughs> why, why is it you and your wife always find a way to take pictures of me when I'm down bad? Like, Y'all don't got no pictures of me when I'm on the top row. Y'all ain't got no pictures of me picking up multiple people and slamming the hell out of them. Y'all got pictures of me down, down bad, down trotting, on the ground, face deep in the mat. Y'all got pictures. I'm like, what's going on? Here? I go to, I go, I t my fiance likes going to wrestling. My wife likes going to wrestling shows with me. And I would say 95% of the pictures that she takes at those shows, it's when the wrestlers is on the ground in front of us rather than the action in the ring. She finds it so funny to take a picture of someone just like on the ground like this at an indie show. Well, I'm glad that she took that picture to show that I was actually selling being knocked over the table and not just out there just laying around. <laughs> <laughs> oh man it was so funny you know what i'm gonna get to my last closing set of questions in a second but another thing i saw about you in your in all the articles i read prior to wwe that i that i found interesting was uh i like that it said you did musical theater growing up uh do you think Maybe. that you'd ever want to like do you think that would you would ever want to do that again or your musical theater Absolutely. Days behind? yeah you seem like someone who no, would want to do that on, still. man i gotta go i gotta get on broadway what you talking about Come on, man. We got to do that. I was Officer Krupke, all right, in West Side Story. Classic. Right? Only because West Side Story is obviously supposed to be about teenagers, and I was I looked like I was an adult compared to everyone else, right? <laughs> so, so, because so, I don't really fit the Krupke look. Yes. Blah, 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 blah. I know my face, it doesn't scream Krupke as the last name. You know what I'm saying? But... I was much bigger than everybody else, so I was the adult in the scene. Um, uh, I was also Bundles the Laundry Man in uh, Annie, in which I, uh, you know, made the most out of that role. Bundles and then the I Laundry Man. Wait, wait, wait. When is Bundles the Laundry Man in Annie? He's not a real character okay. in the movie. <laughs> I was going to say, that character doesn't ring movie, a bell to me. <laughs> in the movie, he don't exist. But on the, in the play, he's like, he's got like, Little funny jokes for a little orphan Annie and her friends while he's uh, taking her laundry away. Got right? it, got it, got it. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, and then I was uh, Big Julie in Guys and Dolls. Um, so, you know, and and I also used to do the plays in church when I was a kid. So I'm always like doing uh, musical theater because uh, I can sing, I can rap, I can dance. And like, if my dancing on a scale of 10, I would rate it like an eight. But because I'm so big, it automatically qualifies as a tip. So I get away with a lot of things. I feel like you've got an inspiring life story that could be turned into like a musical one day, just to implant that I mind in so. your head. Because like you it had would be hard to find the kid to play me that was so big though. I ain't gonna lie to you. <laughs> <laughs> fair point. Fair point. But I'm sure if you type in like fat man on MySpace, you'll find someone similar, <laughs> you know, so <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> All right. Well, we've reached the end of the show here, but I like to end every uh, episode of the show with a segment that I like to call the finishing move, where I talk to my guests good about night. their finishing moves. Yeah, it looks good, right? We did it good that time. I'm real proud of myself here. Things are happening. I'm, I'm proud of my director there. We, we killed it on that one. Uh, so you've got – is – 
is your finishing move like that that world's longest world's strongest slam wasteland combo would that be like your finishing move right now nah my my real finishing move is called the cash out i've done it before on nxt but i haven't had a chance to do it on smackdown because we've only been uh you know trying to get that tag team finish over you know what i'm saying it's called the heavy hitter okay uh but yeah I, my real finisher is called the cash out in which i put them on my shoulders like a fireman's carry i throw them up like aa like oh Cena, yeah duh. okay yes yes i drop down into a neck breaker okay so who's your favorite person to have hit that move on and why uh favorite person to hit that move on yeah. i would probably say uh leon ruff because uh we did it at uh my last show at uh, the sausage castle before i got re-signed to wwe and he didn't have to come out and do that show but he did and i truly appreciate him for that also the move you're looking at that you just throw it up on the screen the world's strongest wasteland uh, you know, there's a, there's this running joke. People did it to Roman for years, and it was completely stupid. Where like they just pretend that you can't wrestle, right? Like they just they did it. They just the fans for some reason pretend you can't wrestle. If I can't wrestle, please tell me how I did this move safely multiple times. Okay, NXT and SmackDown. Look at this. All right, oh, yeah. look at this move right here. The, the the amount of technique and strength that is required for this move. Let's <laughs> just talk about it. That's all I'm saying. If you okay. can't wrestle, then I would like to see someone who 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 says that that can run up the ropes like you did the other day and jump Bingo. off of it. Like, and here, here's another here's another one. Here's what's really crazy about that one. I did that on Friday at SmackDown. Right, I learned it four days earlier on Monday in the PC. Never tried it before, and I was like, yeah, let me just see if I can do it. Da, da, da. Oh yeah, I can. So then I did it on SmackDown that same week. So you know, just give me a little bit of props. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> um, Wait, so then you called it the world's strongest wasteland. Is wasteland. that is that the official name for it then? That is the official name. You're for paying that homage to both of them? Place. Yes, absolutely. Mark Henry is one person who, when I was released, was always there for me and always helping me, um, you know, try to get my foot back in the door. Um, and Mark is a very big guide in my career. Um, and in my life over the last two years. Um, I owe a lot to Mark, and I appreciate him a lot, so I always wanted to pay him homage. And I always thought Wade Barrett had the coolest finish. I always thought the Wasteland was, like, the coolest finish. And I, I don't, for the life of me, don't understand why someone hasn't stolen it from him yet as a finish. Uh, well, twofold on that, I completely agree with you. And But the internet <laughs> has kind of, like, there's, like, it's like this split. Some people think it's the stupidest move ever, and some people think it's awesome. And when I was on here, like, with him the other day, he was on the show a few weeks ago, and uh, I said the same thing. He was like, I know it's frustrating because it's on some of those, like, worst finishing move of all time lists. And, like, I thought it was cool. Like, I liked the move, yeah. you know? But so, he did say like, there's someone in NXT who's doing it now a little better than he did, he was saying. Like, they added a little bit of extra oomph to it that's, like, trying to use it. So, you've got – it's Santino's daughter. What's her name? Uh, I don't even know. I forget her name, but it's, yes, the uh, Santino's daughter who does it. And he was like – I, I hadn't – he says that she does it well, so you got a little bit of competition there. Hey, man, uh, I, I'm glad because it deserves – it deserves its space. It's so funny to me. People will be like, the heavy hitter's not a finish. I'm like, oh, really? Okay. Well, let me put you on my shoulders, six feet in the air. Let Tahuti drop kick you in the side of your head, and then let me spin you around and drop you to the cold, hard ground, and tell me you'll get up in three seconds. <laughs> that's like that's like I saw the other day, that, and then we'll finish up with more question here. But I saw the internet being like, "Oh, Indy Hartwell want a match with a superplex," and I was like, "That." would hurt so bad to get hit with a superplex Bro, i when that when that happened i was like if if i was in that match with her if that wasn't supposed to be the finish it was when i hit the mat and i'm not <laughs> taking no more bumps after that <laughs> I, I had a friend who was who, who when, when he's res, who wrestles and who's trained to wrestle semi recently and i i remember that being one of his notes being like bro i took a superplex and it was the most painful thing of my life like i never want to do that again <laughs> because a lot of time a lot of people a little bit of physics that people don't know is that it's called a double bump so when you hit the mat somebody hits the mat the mat is obviously going to go down first and then so if someone's hitting the mat just after oh. them the mat is coming back up so you're smacking into the mat coming back up oh. and it's not great oh. it's not great <laughs> 
All right, well, lastly, great. We'll, we'll end it with something that should be great. What's the most memorable time you hit a finishing move on someone in one of your matches? Um, I would probably have to say uh, when we had the eight-man tag with the Street Profits, it was our first, like, real test match coming back from SmackDown. And, you know, the Street Profits during the match – so just the fact that we were able to actually get the finish is huge. Um, and, like, the crowd reaction to that, um, it was just crazy. Like, I, I'm i so grateful for how the fans have been to us since we came back because there's a lot of times where you can come back from nine months off and you got to, like, you got to re-earn from the fans – their admiration and while we still have a long way to go as to being you know the top tag team among the fans in wwe um every time that we have a match they're there for us they're there for us during commercial they're there for us when i tag in they're there for us on our entrance they're there for us at the finish like i'm grateful for that because it don't got to be like that and it's not it, it's not always like that so you know, especially when we go do these house shows, like some people don't want to go to the middle of nowhere, Canada, or like, you know, we got, I got family in West Virginia, so I'm excited about our house shows coming up in West Virginia, but not everybody's excited to go to West Virginia. You know what I'm <laughs> yeah, saying? Yeah. So like, but I love those house shows because like, A, it's a chance for us to practice some things and do some new things, but B, it's like those house show fans, man, like they are all the way in it. And like, sometimes that doesn't happen on TV. TV, you got a lot. Sometimes you got to work them into being there for you. But house shows, man, they they go crazy as soon as you come out. So it's like it's it's awesome. But I would definitely say my favorite finish was being able to do our finisher in the eight man tag uh, with uh, with the Street Profits because we got a good spot with the Street Profits and they were going crazy. Well, like the rest of those fans, I'm super excited to see you back in WWE. I'm a fan of yours. I'm glad we finally got to do this. You can finally stop getting mad at me for not yeah, having you on here on, yet. It wasn't this personal. Show. You're supposed to have some more stroke than this. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> This is your show. You're supposed to give me your first chance. Like, you know what well, I'm saying? I gotta get the other, I gotta get my fellow lizard people on first before we get there. Uh, that's so true. that makes sense. You, you, you know, take so. the world over. <laughs> yeah, the Illuminati is strong with this one. I understand what's going on. All you right, know. well, you have a good one, dude. You know <laughs> <laughs> AJ Top Dollar, <laughs> thank you so much for doing this. I appreciate it. Hey, appreciate you, brother. Peace. <laughs> All right, that was my conversation with Top Dalla. I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I did. Super cool guy. Loved getting to pick his brain. Super inspiring story. Uh, and I genuinely believe that you should follow your dreams just like he did if you're someone who's on the border of, of doing something like that. All right, a, a little bit of shilling before we get out of here. Make sure that you subscribe to the WWE on Fox YouTube channel. You watching right there. If you can see me pointing at you, I'm talking to you. Uh, hit the subscribe button and make sure that you follow this YouTube channel. There's a bunch of stuff on here that you would want if you're a wrestling fan. There's clips from Raw and SmackDown. There's YouTube shorts. There's clips from this show and so much more. So make sure you subscribe to the WWE on Fox YouTube channel. And these videos, they go up they get set for premiere, so once you see these videos, you can click the little bell and get notified once the video goes live. Also, like I said at the top of the show, make sure you subscribe to the Out of Character podcast feed. That's where you can find the audio version of this show, but also Raw and SmackDown roundups every week in the podcast feed where I'm breaking down each episode of those shows segment by segment, giving you my thoughts on everything that happens I implore you to listen to these shows because I'm talking to myself and it really does feel better when you guys are listening and you give me that feedback because otherwise I feel crazy talking to myself in my office alone. Uh, it really does help. And the way I know that you listened or watched is you leaving a rating or a review. If you leave a review, it helps the show out a lot. So if you enjoyed the conversation that I had with Top Dollar, if you enjoy the content that we put out here on either the YouTube channel 
or the podcast feed. Go to Apple Podcasts and put in a review. You can let people know that you enjoyed this show, and it does help us get seen by more people. So for those of you who do that, I thank you. But if you enjoyed the show, hook it up. If you didn't enjoy the show, just ignore you heard any of this. And also, lastly, make sure that you follow us on social media, at WWE on Fox, on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Whatever social media platform you are on, we are most likely there as well. So give us a follow. (sighs) Okay, I got it all out. All right, that's it. I'm done officially tapping out for now. Until next time, I'm Ryan Satin, and this is Out of Character.